What? Oh, there it was, sorry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Professor Ensby, for organising such a splendid day and for inviting me to speak at it. The three um, slide, uh, pictures on my introduction are to remind you there are, th there are different climatic disasters in different parts of the world. This in New Zealand, this in uh, Sweden, and this one in America. And I just want to start off with the thought that climate change is a natural phenomenon and it's dangerous. Right, if you write to your MP, be he or she federal or state, you'll get a, a, and say, I'm worried about all this stuff in the papers about global warming, and I, I think there's some scientists who, who will tell you it's not as dangerous as you're led to believe. And here are some of my reasons. You get a letter back like this. The Queensland government, along with the Australian government and governments around the world, supports the findings of the IPCC. Note, this stands for the Intergovernmental, not the International Panel on Climate Change. It's a governmental body. It's a political body. And those advised by many fine scientists, the pronouncements it makes are political pronouncements. Australia does not take advice from the World Bank on setting its annual budget. So why is it that we lie down prostate in colonial cringe in taking our environmental advice from the IPCC? That's a rhetorical question. I don't know the answer. You can tell me. So that's the first thing. That's what the government thinks it's doing, and that is, in fact, what they're doing. The minister will go on to say, these alternative views you've put have largely been discredited. Oh, is that the case? Um, various propositions were not supported by the peer-reviewed science, including that, well, no, global warming is not a real issue. There was nothing about that in my letter. That humans have not caused global warming. There was nothing about that in my letter. Of course humans cause warming. You've heard about it today. The heat island effect around big cities. That temperature rises have been exaggerated. Well, perhaps they have. And that increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide do not cause global warming. No scientist on the planet would make that statement. So where did the minister's advisor who wrote this form letter get the idea from? Well, he got it from the time-honoured tradition of straw men. <laughs> now, you're laughing. You shouldn't be laughing. No scientist, however senior, if he or she is independent of the IPCC, can have a sensible dialogue with a public official in any Western nation. They will attack the scientist or they will invent straw men and put words in your mouth. That's a very serious issue. Well, I don't have time to give you the talk that underlies these conclusions. Here's the conclusions of the talk I normally give on climate change. They tell you the science is settled. Well, no scientist would ever make that statement. So for the moment, I'm being a politician for this slide. Forgive me. This science is indeed settled. Here are the, keys, are the six most important facts. Firstly, global temperature did indeed warm slightly in the late 20th century. That's true. Nobody doubts it. Secondly, this warming was unusual in neither rate nor magnitude, and we've had examples of that today. Thirdly, global average temperature has declined since 1998. I'll say that again, global average has declined since 1998. But since 1998, atmospheric carbon dioxide has increased by 5%. Hey, hang on, that can't be right. What's that idea of Penny Wong's? Crazy idea that if more carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere, it will cause dangerous global warming. That's a hypothesis. That's what scientists do, not Penny Wong, apparently. But scientists test hypotheses. Here's the test of the hypothesis. 5% more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Has it warmed? Not at all, let alone dangerously. It's cooled. That disproves the hypothesis. As Einstein famously said, when a hundred physicists got together to criticise his theory and wrote a book about it, it doesn't take a hundred physicists to prove me wrong, it takes one fact. A hypothesis is disproven by one fact, even though you may have 999 facts that are consistent with the hypothesis. So this point's more important than the other five, but nonetheless it's one of the five points. Here's the next one. Humans have an effect on local climate, of course they do. Some places it's warming around cities, if we clear land, we cut down dark trees and we plant light-coloured crops like wheat, that causes more radiation, we bounce back to space, that causes local cooling. 
So across the planet, we, there must be a net human signal. Again, no scientist doubts that. The argument is not about whether humans have an effect on global climate, but on whether you can measure it and which direction it's going. We don't even know whether the net global effect is warming or cooling, but we do know the effect must be there, buried somewhere in the noisy data. We live on a dynamic planet. David showed us earlier the picture of uh, changing sea ice area around the world. Uh, Everything changes. Ice volume, sea level, storm intensity, believe it or not, even the number of polar bears change from year to year. Get used to it. Mr. Gore is completely oblivious to that fact. His film's a wonderful piece of natural history photography, but the soundtrack completely ignores the fact we live on a dynamic planet. Lastly, carbon dioxide is an environmental benefit, and thank you to David for showing that so well. Excuse me, I need to wash my mouth again. I didn't really need to, that was a joke, are you asleep or something? <laughs> because it's a mild greenhouse gas and it's much better to have a planet that is, as Bill Kinnamont follows, plus 14 or 15 degrees on average rather than minus 18. So mild greenhouse gases are a good thing and it's a very powerful plant fertilizer. So those are the six facts. What is the problem? There's supposed to be a global crisis. Every country in the world is scurrying around with not tens, not hundreds, but thousands of diplomats and scientists each trying to come to some agreement in Copenhagen to cut the production of an environmentally beneficial gas. Now, everybody in this room I know is light green. We're all light green. We love the environment. But our dark green friends get extremely upset at this point. But, 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 but Bob, they say, you can't say that. People will think climate change isn't a problem. Well, I hate to contradict the distinguished professor, but climate change is a problem. What isn't a problem is dangerous warming caused by human carbon dioxide emissions. However, the reason it is so dangerous that governments are obsessed with that is it means they are completely ignoring the real hazard. And the real hazard is very real. That's one example. That was when Australia woke up to the fact, in modern times, that climate change is a deadly hazard to climate events, and they're relating to climate change. Here's the weather map on the day. There is a monsoonal trough over the north side of the country, and there's a depression approaching out of the Southern Ocean with a minor uh, front on the front of it. Here's the wind speed and direction map for Melbourne on the day. We have a 30 knot wind coming. These bars, blue bars here are the direction of the wind on this scale. It's a northerly wind. And during the afternoon, it starts to back down here and it starts back up as a southerly wind, 180 degrees south there, but still with an intensity of around 30 knots. Very strong. As everybody in this room knows, that's what caught both the firefighting crews and also the various residents by surprise. The fire front reversed, goes in a different direction. It does enormous damage. Global warming, human-caused global warming, has nothing whatsoever to do with this. I'm amazed that there's apparently a judicial commission sitting at the moment which is going to spend hours listening to evidence as to this being due to global warming. There is not any possibility whatsoever that global warming's got anything to do with it. It's a natural climate event such as the planet has always been heir to. At exactly the same time, up where I live, here's the monsoonal trough, we had 47 inches of rain, that's 1.2 metres in seven days, that's more than six inches a day for a week. It's not surprising that more than 60% of Queensland was declared a disaster area. Nothing to do with global warming, this is a natural climate event. What is a government's most sovereign duty? 
is to protect the people that are in its care. The government's most sovereign duty is to prepare for events like this and be ready to adapt to them when they happen. The government is actually at the moment neglecting its duty of care to the people because it's running around worrying about imaginary global warming. This is not imaginary. People that lost property and friends and lives in the Victorian bushfire should be pounding on the door of the government over these issues. Well, if we go to another part of the world, Scandinavia, we find they have natural hazards too. It's a beautiful picturesque fjord here, and this is a lovely little town of Fjord along the side of it. And note particularly these two larger houses and all these boat sheds along here. April the 9th, 1934, 40 people died because a lump fell off the side of the fjord, generated a tsunami which ran up the side here 75 metres. Here's a historic photo. Note these two houses, same as those two. And here are the batch, and this, there are the two houses again. It was a disaster. It's quite a small local disaster, but if you live in Scandinavia, this is a major threat. Uh, rock falls and tsunamis generated by them in the fields. Uh, if you live in Britain nearby, the biggest hazard is storms. Here's Britain coming out of the Atlantic. This was giant storm Andrew on October 16, 1987. It was the worst storm since 1703. There were 22 deaths. Of course, Scandinavia and northern Germany also get clobbered by these storms. And hurricane winds, massive clear-up operation, 13 people known as and so on and so forth. More recently, 2007, uh, this is the extent of the floods in the United Kingdom. That's almost as bad as Queensland. <coughs> $2 billion worth of damage, 13 people killed. I stress again, these are not imaginary events. This is not a computer model. This is real people's lives being affected by this stuff. If we go to New Zealand, we find a rather different set of natural hazards because New Zealand geologically sits on a plate boundary and on plate boundaries bring with them volcanoes and earthquakes. So the volcanic uh, centre in the middle of the North Island uh, erupts from time to time and it will produce ash or lava flows over half the North Island if another big eruption happens, or I should say when another big eruption happens. Secondly, here's the fault that runs through Wellington, the harbour of Wellington, the city developed in here. And just like Los Angeles and San Francisco, it is not if, it is when, Wellington is destroyed by a major earthquake. And the, the property damage and loss of life and so on will run to billions, tens of billions of dollars, in fact. So, if we make a list of natural hazards for New Zealand, at the top are earthquake and volcanic eruption. And that's not to say that storms and floods and bushfires aren't important, but on the scale of really, truly catastrophic disasters, they're towards the bottom of the New Zealand list. This leads me to the key point I'm trying to get across, which is horses for courses. You don't live in Australia, uh, in New Zealand. The chances of you having to worry about a volcanic eruption are almost zero and earthquakes small. So if we do a similar list for Australia, interestingly, it's almost the other way around. The biggest threats are bushfires, flooding and storm damage, and these are much lesser threats here. But the government's job is to prepare for these environmental threats here, not in New Zealand and not worldwide. All these events are unpredictable and they're unpreventable. Do you have any friends that have tried to stop a volcanic eruption? You're laughing again. You're laughing. The government is trying to stop climate change. That's effectively trying to stop the clouds scudding across the sky. So, for an unpredictable and unpreventable event, and climate change and sea level rise are just the same, <clears throat> we have to have a different approach. Now, so that's the first point I want to get across is that natural hazards, including climate hazards, are related to local geography. Picking up that theme, I've never met anybody that lives in a world climate. There's no such thing. It's imaginary. It's a fiction, useful for scientific analysis in some cases. This is the famous map from Kirpin, a, a Russian climatologist first developed in the early part of the 20th century. It divides the world roughly into about 28 climatic zones. If we come to our part of the world, uh, we see we have equatorial zones up here and actually right at the tip of Cape York, then a tropical belt, grassland, desert, and the 
temperate zones down here. It's quite obvious that the climate hazards in Darwin are different from those in Mount Isa and are different from those in Tasmania. We've got a Ministry for Climate Change and a Minister for Climate. Have you heard her talking about being prepared for the risks here are different to the risks here? No, she's way off dreaming away about global climate change. Climate hazards stem from local geographic setting. If we go back to New Zealand, <clears throat> cost of weather related disasters, 1968 to 2006, and this is a list of, of where they were. Now, weather related. Climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. What a wonderful saying. <laughs> Scientists tend to like the definitions with numbers. So, to meteorologists, climate is weather measured over 30 years. Take a 30 year temperature record for, uh, for Melbourne, so average that for the, uh, for the annual temperature for each of those years and you've got one climate data point for Melbourne. Is that written in the sky by God? No. It's just a useful statistical contrivance that meteorologists and climatologists use. It has no reality in nature whatsoever. The same processes that control Climate change we see in action every day with the weather. From the microsecond changes that take place in, cha in ice crystals growing inside clouds through to million year long cycles relating to the Earth's changing orbit around the sun. And in between there's any number of other cycles. Dave has been talking about some of the solar ones. This is a continuum of processes. There is no distinction between weather and climate in the real world. So, these are not only weather-related disasters, they're climate-related disasters. They total 1.68 billion, and that's about 4 billion per 100 years. That's about what New Zealand is going to have to spend uh, on dealing with these climatic disasters. <coughs> Accordingly, they've set up an agency called Geonet, which links to a natural hazard centre, which is responsible for planning for and reacting to these things. Five out of these nine hazards are climate-related events. The two big exceptions are the ones I've mentioned, volcanic activity and earthquakes. <clears throat> they maintain a website where you can go on and you click on the uh, home page or the earthquake page. Here are the earthquakes in the North Island. You can drill down to each and any of these and get all the information you need or want. And in the event of a disastrous earthquake, information will be posted here for use of the citizen. Here's the page for volcanoes. And in fact, the volcanoes are very quiet, but there's a bulletin from each volcano at the time. Details don't matter, it's the principle that's important. This is a world best practice, in fact, system set up in New Zealand. It is already dealing with the short end, short range end of climate related disasters. It's a very simple thing to do to ask it also to be responsible for longer term planning and adaptation regarding climate change. And I can tell you it's an awfully lot cheaper and signing international documents that you're going to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, which will have no effect whatsoever on your climate or anybody else's. In New Zealand, it's linked to an insurance, national insurance scheme called the Earthquake Commission. Some people in the room will be sympathetic to that. Others will think, no, that people should look after themselves. But the feeling in New Zealand is that some um, emergencies are so great, you can't expect, some hazards are so great, you can't expect the citizen to insure against them themselves. So they have this linkage. Well, how many people in the room knew that Australia also has an emergency management agency? I didn't. I only discovered this about two months ago. I was amazed. It's actually run, guess who, by the Attorney General. Oh, I mean, that's where you'd expect, wouldn't you? <laughs> My word. Well, it turns out, and I don't want to mock them, I'm sure they're very good people doing a very good job, but it turns out Emergency Management Australia is a training organisation. It has no real-life uh, responsibilities or anything like that, not least because of all the complications of dealing with the states and so on. But, uh, again, in principle, we do have such a thing in Australia, but at the moment it only deals with training. <coughs> right, here's the context, the most important context that's missing on climate change. <coughs> it's the last 25,000 years. The red curve is the temperature in Greenland and the blue curve is the temperature in Antarctica. In both cases from ice cores. We see that back here, 25, 20,000 years ago, that the, the climate is cold. 
So we're jigging along, and this is the last great glaciation. About 18,000 years ago, it starts to warm up, and here's the Holocene, the 10,000 year long interglacial that we've lived in, and interestingly, the domestication of plants and animals and so on all started in here during this warm period. Warm, strangely, equals good. Well, when you, first thing you see here is that climate is always changing, up and down by about a degree or so. Change is what climate does. In fact, the phrase climate change is a tautology. You don't need it. Climate. Yeah, that's what climate does. It changes. Right. So this is a typical climatic record. But as we go from a major cold state to a major warm state and warm up, we find in Greenland this incredibly strong climatic reversal where it warms up almost to the full interglacial, cools down to back to almost the glaciation and comes up again. It's called the Younger Dryas, YD, after this little plant, which is the driest plant, which grows only on barren alpine heathland around the end of glaciers and ice caps. And the pollen from this plant is particularly common in lake cores that were taken to establish records like this. Well, what you're, some of you have been thinking is, yes, he's, he's sort of done a bit of a slate of the hand there with weather climate stuff, hasn't he? But we all know that long-term climate change is really different for short-term, these sharp events. He, he, so he's making that up. We, we really do need to deal with long-term climate change as a different category. Well, do we? Here's the Younger Dryas, and the change, this warming here, took place in three years paper in Nature this year. This warming here took a little bit longer, 60 years. The difference between here and here is a temperature difference of summer 4 degrees, this is in Greenland, and winter 28 degrees, uh, in other words an average difference of 16 degrees uh, at that point. And it can change in 3 or 4 years from one to the other. Anybody in the audience know why? No scientist on the planet knows why. And there's lots of other changes like this. They're all equally unknown as to cause. Lots of scientists spend their life studying it and can give you good hypotheses and talk about it and they're intelligent and rational, but nobody knows in a predictive sense what is causing these sorts of things. This diagram also makes the point that climate changes are regional or local. The Younger Dryas does not exist as such in Antarctica. This slight cooling here is, a, is thought to be a different phenomenon. But even if it was the same phenomenon, it's clearly much more manifest in Greenland. So if you're the government of Greenland, you need a different climate policy to the government of Antarctica. You've got a different beast to handle. And it's not global climate, it's local climate. Okay, well, here's the ice sheet and the, the floating ice, sea ice in the Arctic, at the end of winter 2004. So that's the maximum extent of the sea ice. The red spot is the ice core from which the last record came, and here's the edge of the sea ice. Now, 12,000 years ago, when it was 16 degrees cooler on average, in the Younger Dryas, here's the reconstruction of where the forward edge of the sea ice was. I've just flown from Heathrow. There wasn't much shipping coming out of the channel ports 16, 12,000 years ago. Remember, these changes can take place in just a few years to a few decades. Climate change, both warming and cooling, is a natural hazard, a deadly natural hazard on all timescales. Our government is completely asleep on this issue. It is so busy trying to manufacture political advantage from global warming hysteria. Okay, the essence. Natural climate change is the real danger. It demands to be prepared for and adapted to as it occurs. The needed response is not global. It needs to be tailored to the appropriate region. Nations each require their own uh, emergency management uh, agency, or GeoNet, or HazNet, whatever you want to call it. Hypothetical human-caused climate change, should it occur, We've spent $50 billion since 1990 looking for it, and no scientist can actually measure the signal or identify it, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep an eye open for it. And if it occurs, if you are prepared for natural climate change, you are pre-prepared for possible human change too. But, so the solution then is to set up a, another great federal bureaucracy. Yeah, I love that. But, that's the but, because time, having had a full 
uh, cover that I showed you on the first slide when Hurricane Katrina struck, a month later had another cover about system failure and what happened, why did the emergency management agency in the US get it so wrong. It's already clear this debacle was more than an act of God. The scarier things get, the fuzzier lines of authority become. At every level of government, uncertainty about who is in charge at crucial moments, leaders afraid to lead, and so on. I do believe we need a national bureaucracy, but I also believe we have to learn from the Americans and others and set that up in a tight way, and this danger will always be there. This is the website for the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency in the US, and after Hurricane Katrina, it was restructured, March 1, 2003, it became part of the Department of Homeland Security. By a piece of astonishing mislogic, the primary mission of the FEMA is to reduce loss of acts of terrorism. Because, of course, that's what the um, Homeland Security Agency was about. So, if we change a word here, supporting the nation in a risk-based comprehensive emergency management system of preparedness, protection, that's good, provided we change that to natural hazard and we take out terrorism. That's got nothing to do with it. We're talking about natural hazards. And then you have effectively a mission statement for what is needed in Australia. Well. <laughs> I wonder what they're looking for. I think they're disturbed because this graph here, you see, is the temperature since uh, 2002, and, and the temperature's going down. They're a bit worried, so they're looking for the proper graph. And hello, this fellow found it. <laughs> this is the famous hockey stick graph, which has now been shown to be a piece of utter statistical chicanery, choosing my words carefully. And this is the gentleman who, with the aid of his advertising agency making good movies for him, was awarded the Nobel Prize, Dr. Pachari. The other two gentlemen, our own Prime Minister and New Zealand's Prime Minister. These two gentlemen intend to impose on their peoples, in Kevin Rudd's case, $3,000 per family per year in new taxes starting next year, if that bill is passed. In New Zealand, 2340 a lesser figure because they have a much greater hydro mix in their power system than we do. We're much more dependent on coal. You can double these figures in terms of the actual costs to families. That's just the direct cost of the direct carbon tax. There's a manifold other costs that are going to go with this. These are huge sums of money. These are responsible men. They're prime ministers. They wouldn't be doing this, that's the cost, unless there was a benefit. What's the benefit? Oh, oh no, we've got this warming problem. So we're going to reduce what we're going to stop a carbon dioxide. It's a greenhouse gas, that's right, it is prime minister. So if we stop a little bit of it going to the atmosphere, we'll cause some cooling, or we'll prevent a little bit of warming taking place. Dead right, Prime Minister. How much, Prime Minister? <laughs> one ten thousandth of one degree. That's the cost. That's the benefit. I have given a lecture similar to this in New Zealand about five times, three weeks ago, and in Australia repeatedly, not one newspaper in this country will publish those figures. Why not? Because the taxpayers, the second they knew this was the real cost-benefit equation, would completely reject this nonsense. Carbon dioxide taxation will result in no measurable climate benefit whatsoever. OK, will 2020 be like the little ice age? Two metres thick ice at London Bridge, uh, frozen, and this may look pretty, but the reality, as we heard earlier from Professor Endersby, was horrible. Plague, famine, millions of people dying. So that's the little ice age. Or will it be like this with the Romans drinking wine in the north of England, uh, the medieval warm period and the Roman warm period? Well, it's a pretty reasonable question. So I'm now the Minister for Climate. I'm asked to make policy. And I ask my advisor this, because I need to know this before I can set policy. What's the answer? Well, 2020, it's only 11 years away, be like the little ice age or... The answer is, that's absolutely staggering. There is not a scientist on this planet, despite what David told us earlier, that can guarantee you that answer. Lots of us think we can have answers, we can give you guidance, but the hard reality is no one knows. 
It is completely irresponsible in such circumstances to be planning what the government is planning at the moment. We obviously need to prepare for either. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? Instead, we have Plan A, the IPCC's plan, which is to stop carbon dioxide emissions because that will stop dangerous warming. Well, Plan A hasn't worked. We've tried it already with Kyoto. Looked outside the window lately, does that make a difference to the climate? No, it didn't. Trillions of dollars, no effect. Plan A hasn't worked. Plan A won't work either. We know that from early mover nations like Denmark, uh, so Norway, which introduced a 20 to $30 dollar carbon tax back in the early 1990s and have had it ever since. That's the same range that Mr. Rudd was thinking of having his tax in until he got frightened and reduced it by half. Okay, so 20 to 30 dollars per ton since 1990, what's happened to Norway's emissions? They've increased by 15%. So, plan A hasn't worked, it won't work for that reason, and it can't work. David Archibald showed you the graph. The logarithmic relationship between increase in carbon dioxide and increase in temperature. We can double carbon dioxide and double it again, and the consequent warming at most will be of the order of a degree. Plan A hasn't worked, it won't work, and it can't work. Have you heard anybody suggest a plan B? This is truly extraordinary. Our society is obsessed with this issue. Yet, it hasn't worked, it won't work, and it can't work. So, what's plan B? Plan B. <laughs> the bushfires, the storms, the landslides are going to continue to occur in 2020, whether it's warmer than today or colder. Plan B must be adaptation to climate change, as it happens, hazard precaution. It is the ultimate precautionary approach, although the Greens will tell you that their approach is the precautionary approach. As usual, they're telling fairy stories to the pixies at the bottom of the garden. Thank you.